Hi folks, thanks for joining today and let's talk about just-in-time compaction in Tiger Builder. My name is Alex, I am also known as MatCloud on GitHub and actually for most of my career I was writing compilers and IDEs for Rust. It's only recently that I've switched to write in a database and in Zeek of all the languages. So by no means I'm a database expert yet. Uh, nonetheless, I would like to share a couple of things I learned about this particular database with you. So to set up the context, what is Tigerbital? Tigerbital is a distributed database for financial accounting. That means that physically it is a cluster of six distinct replicas, six different machines, which nonetheless behave as if it is just a single machine. What is unusual about Tricapital relative to other databases is that it provides availability in spite of disk faults. So when Tricapital writes data to local hard drive or SSD, it doesn't necessarily assume that the results are guaranteed to be durable. The principle is not wasting durability. And if at some point this returns you an error, you shouldn't just fail. And instead, you should use the copy of the data on uh, one of the other six replicas to repair yourself and to continue operating. In this talk, we are going to talk about LSM compaction. And this is going to be uh, rather short, but nonetheless, deep dive. So I won't be explaining what an LSM is and how LSM compaction works in general. Rather, I will focus only on what makes Tigerbeetle's flavor of LSM compaction interesting. But quickly, compaction is a process which takes an LSM tree, a data structure or on persistent storage, and optimizes its representation. That is, before and after compaction, LSM tree contains the same logical set of key value pairs, but hopefully after compaction, it occupies a smaller number of disk blocks. So while we keep logical contents the same, we compact the physical representation. Uh, okay, and let's see how this ties with this disk tolerance. Suppose you're a replica and you are serving some uh, read for a certain key and you read data from disk and your disk returns an error because, well, disks are failable. Now you should somehow repair the data using the copy uh, of this data which was replicated to one of the other replicas. And here you have two big choices. You either do logical repair that is, you request a set of key value pairs from one of your peer replicas, or you do a physical repair. Physical repair means that you go and request a specific disk block, a specific region of the hard drive, without thinking too much how it maps to your LSM tree. So logical repair feels, at least initially, simpler, but it is actually quite hard to do right. Uh, the first problem with logical repair is that it is some specialized code for each data structure. So for example, if your database supports both LSM tree and the B tree, if you go for logical repair, you would have to write separate repair code for LSM tree and for B tree. But that's not even like the biggest problem. The biggest problem is this. Suppose that your data structure on disk is some kind of like persistent tree. And suppose you actually get this corruption somewhere near the root of this tree. Now, if you want to repair this tree logically, that means that you now have to transfer all the key value pairs for the entirety of the tree, uh, despite the fact that only one root node was corrupted. So this is slow. Moreover, this is unreliable because if any other tree node gets corrupted on a different replica, that different replica won't be able to 
help you with repair because it won't have this data logically. So the problem here is although physical errors are uncorrelated, different blocks are faulty on different replicas, logically they touch the same tree and make the entire tree unavailable. In contrast, physical repair is stupidly simple and crazily fast. This is the entire interface for physical repair in TigerBeetle. There is a function, read block, which takes an address of a block on disk, the expected checksum, it asynchronously reads these data blocks block and calls the callback passing uh, the contents of the block as a parameter. Notice how there isn't any kind of error handling here. Callback doesn't accept an enum of the contents of a block and some kind of an error code. It always guarantees to fetch the block. The way this works internally is that the replica transparently tries to read the given block from its local disk, and if checksum doesn't match, it will just go and ask for this same block from some other uh, replica. What's more, this simple function provides repair for any data structure which is implemented in terms of uh, grid blocks. So yeah, this is this is really cool. There is just one catch. To make this function works, it is not enough that data is logically identical across replicas. You really need the data to be physically identical. The same data should be represented in the same way everywhere. And that runs straight into your standard strategy for implementing compaction. The way compaction typically works is that you have some kind of a background thread or even background process which periodically reads your data, finds redundancies, and tries to eliminate those redundancies, keeping the data logically the same. And the results of this compaction depend on the order uh, between this compacting thread and the normal thread that mutates the database. So if you do compaction in background thread, you don't get to have deterministic data files across replicas, and you would have to implement logical repair, something we uh, don't want to do. So the idea here is to uh, steal a page from language runtime and implement compaction just in time, as sometimes people implement garbage collection. So for many garbage collection algorithms, there is a separate garbage collection thread, which periodically uh, pauses your application and runs garbage collection. But there is a much simpler just-in-time strategy for garbage collection, which is to run uh, GC during allocation, during call to malloc. So every time application calls a malloc, it does a little bit of garbage collection. And this is exactly the idea of how to make compaction deterministic for TigerBeetle. During normal transaction processing, during normal commits, every time we process a request, we are going to do a tiny bit of compaction. So let's take a closer look at this process. Uh, Compaction runs according to a certain rhythm. Specifically, like the interval of compaction is 32 requests, which is called a bar. During a bar, requests are processed and their results are accumulated in the so-called in-memory table. So after the 32 requests, when the 33rd one arrives, we go and move this in-memory table to disk. To be able to move this table to disk, we actually uh, need to have free space uh, in our LSM tree for one more table. So that means that while we are accumulating in-memory table, we also concurrently are running just enough of our compaction to allow moving this in-memory table to disk. And this thing repeats. So at any given point in time, we are accumulating some uh, results in an in-memory table. We are running compaction. And then at some point, we do buffer flee, where compaction finishes. And it leaves just enough of extra space in our LSM tree for in-memory table. Let's take a closer look at uh, how this works. And we are going to be thinking backwards. So for request number 32, we need to dump an in-memory table to level zero. 
That means that by the 30 second request, there should be a space in uh, level zero. That means uh, that we need to run compaction from level zero before that. So let's say that during requests 16 to 31, uh, what we do is that we move one table from level zero to level one. We want to be as lazy as possible. We want to do as little compaction as possible. So we only uh, make space in level zero for one new table. Again, to move table from level zero to level one, we need to have free space in level one. If we want to start moving this table on the 16th request, that means that by 16th request, there should be free space in level one. So uh, again, thinking backwards, that means that during requests zero to 15, we are going to move one table from level one to level two. Summarizing. Our goal here is for each level of LSM3 to sync just one table down to do just enough compaction to allow the next round of compaction to proceed. And uh, the idea is that in the second half of our uh, 32 request bar, we are going to uh, move tables from odd levels uh, during the second bar, we are going to move tables from even levels to the odd levels. And during the first half of the bar, we are going to move tables from uh, odd levels to even levels, uh, such that by the end of the compaction bar, we have free space in uh, level zero to accommodate the new in-memory table, but we also have free space in all other even numbered layers so that we could start the next round of compaction, which would compact odd levels into uh, even ones. And while we are looking at this picture, please take a note how actually there is a lot of latent parallelism in this picture. In particular, uh, compaction from level zero to level one and compaction from level two to level three could uh, proceed in parallel because they are disjoint. And we really do want to take advantage of this parallelism to make the compaction process fast. But herein uh, lies the problem. Parallelism in general is non-deterministic. So if you just run this to compaction from level zero to level one and from level two uh, to level three in parallel, they will race with each other, and the actual result on disk might depend on the order of compactions. Again, this is something we don't want to do because we have to have determinism to enable physical repair. So uh, that is the quiz. How can we make compaction parallel but still deterministic? To figure that out, we need to zoom in into compaction algorithm and realize which step causes this contention, which step causes no determinism. Each compaction internally is going to read some input data and reading input data can be done uh, perfectly fine in parallel. Then it is going to merge uh, the input data and eliminate redundancy, drop tombstones again. This is all fully deterministic and fine. Finally, the transaction, uh, the compaction is going to write uh, the data. And again, uh, the actual data we are running is going to be fully deterministic because there isn't any kind of like read-write races when we read input blocks. The only place where no determinism sneaks in is when we decide where on disk are we going to uh, write our new data. The no determinism happens when compaction asks for a new free block on disk. So to make parallel compaction deterministic, we need to make block allocation deterministic. And that is actually not that hard to do. The idea is to split block allocation into sequential reservation phase and concurrent allocation proper. So uh, let's say uh, we have uh, this uh, set of full and uh, field blocks as on the first line on this slide. So the uh, blue squares are, uh, are full blocks and um, 
Y squares are blocks we could use to write new data as a result of compaction. And let's see, we want to run two compactions in parallel, green compaction and pink compaction. The first thing we do is that we ask uh, these two compaction to estimate the worst case number of blocks they might need to allocate. And let's say both of them say, hey, I need uh, four blocks at most. At this point, we go and reserve disjoint sets of blocks for green and for pink compaction, represented with green and pink rectangles, such that each block contains uh, enough of uh, three uh, little squares. This reservation phase has to happen sequentially. But then we could just run those two compactions in parallel, restricting them to allocating blocks only from their respective reservations. So uh, we get uh, this picture as in the third row, where uh, green and pink little squares are created concurrently, but they still are created in the same order because they are created from disjoint pools of free uh, blocks. Finally, uh, when we compaction uh, ends, it doesn't necessarily have to use all of the allocated blocks, so the unused blocks are returned to this shared pool of free blocks. To make this work, there is one very significant restriction. Namely, compaction uh, must actually be able to upfront, say, the worst case bound on the amount of blocks they are going to allocate. But because we are running compaction just in time, we only move in one table from level A to level B. Uh, and that means that we have a known upper bound for the number of blocks compaction could write. So given this is already just in time compaction, we can have this upper bound, which allows us to run everything in parallel. So let's summarize. Tagibital has a storage fault model. Tagibital assumes that disk can fail and that it is Tagibital's job to go and uh, repair replicas local disk using redundancy present in the cluster. To implement this repair, Tagibital uses physical strategy, which requires that data files are byte for byte identical across the cluster. In particular, this means that LSM tree must be deterministic, which runs against the standard uh, strategy for implementing LSM compaction as a concurrent process. Instead, Tidal tightly integrates compaction process with normal compaction processing. Every uh, normal transaction processing, every time Tidal processes a request, it executes a tiny bit of compaction work, just enough compaction to let uh, the next request proceed successfully. Nonetheless, Despite this uh, very fine-grained subdivision of compaction work across requests, it is still possible to exploit the latent parallelism to run independent compactions, not only concurrently, but truly in parallel. Uh, to make this work, uh, the only thing you need is deterministic block allocator, which is luckily easy to implement if you do just enough compaction and you have the upper bounds on the number of blocks uh, you need to allocate during a single round of compaction. That's basically it. This was a uh, very quick but uh, rather deep walk through the uh, high-level structure of compaction in Tragibital. If you uh, would like to know more to uh, learn every uh, nitty-gritty detail about compaction, then please check this uh, playlist on YouTube where I do a deep dive into the internals of uh, Tragibital. Thanks again for watching.